John, welcome, buddy. This is I, first of all, I feel pretty big time now. Before we got on, I had to ask you about the backdrop, right now. <laughs> and the, re- the reason I need to ask you is I had no idea until Jeff Passan was on Twitter and he went, "Boom!" is literally a pull down. But that's real, right? That bookshelf's real. <laughs> this is real. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. Uh, <laughs> it is real. Uh, this is the bookshelf uh, in the Morosi home office. Uh, you see it, I suppose, if you're watching MLB Network. Uh, you'll see that behind me as well. Uh, good collection of sports books back there. I, I try to have read of them, at least in part, so that way if I'm quizzed on them, I'm able to render some sort of thought about what I've got back there. But it's a nice – I try to have a collection of uh, mostly baseball, soccer, American football, uh, those types of history books, a little bit of that as well. So th- those are probably my main areas of interest. And so I, I try to have a good <laughs> eclectic selection of books from a lot of different countries around the world. Because if I'm watching you on, on MLB Network or, or Fox, right, and I see that backdrop, now it's crystal clear HD. Is it strategic what book goes where? That's a great question. And, <laughs> and the answer is yes. Uh, so uh, it's strategic in, in the sense that uh, they all have to be somewhat germane to the subject matter uh, or, oh. or at least of personal significance to me in a sports context. Uh, so I've got uh, a lot of sports, some Italian sports i've got some italian language books back there spanish language books uh those are both languages that mean a lot to my family and i uh, i've got some canadian fiction uh, mordecai richler a great canadian author uh he, his book is back there i've got madeline in an ode to my children uh one of the one of the all-time great children's books we're all fans of madeline in our house so uh some of them are, are touchstones friends of mine that have written books and, and often they will say uh, like alex spears new book uh, about the red sox is back there and Alex uh, said, hey, like, is, is it going to be on the shelf? I said, of course it's going to be on the shelf. So, uh, so it, it does become a little bit of a, an ongoing uh, conversation topic when I go to the press box at a new ballpark. Hey, you know, I see my, my book oh, yeah. is on this spot or that spot. So it ends up becoming a, a little bit of a, a story. Even Tyler Kepner's book uh, is, is back there. And there was a, a thought we had. a I think that was back when Michigan and Vanderbilt were playing in the college world series and even though i didn't go to michigan i'm still you know living in ann arbor and i'm a michigan fan so i I've, I've got uh tyler's book back there and so we said okay well if vandy wins then your book's going to be on the shelf and this, is, this is a big uh conversation topic on the uh on the air on mlb network radio at one point in time so we, we try to have fun with it and, and it's all it's all goodwill it's all I, I like to be able to just kind of say it's all it's all in fun and, and kind of a conversation as to who moves up the power rankings of the Morosi bookshelf? <laughs> well, because okay, like for example, when when Edgar, when there was a push to get him into the Hall of Fame, you know, I mean, you could see over over your right shoulder, yes. Edgar, there's a there's an Edgar book, and I, I kept thinking to myself, I mean, at that point, you and I had known each other. I think we'd cross paths maybe on Twitter or or, or somewhere, but I always wanted to be like, hey, man, is this literally sitting over that right shoulder? Just because it's topic of conversation. <laughs> now, with the artwork, with the artwork you got, who chooses yes. that? From so the kids. it's a great question. Uh, <laughs> so at MLB Network, we've got a great recording producer, Ethan Kleinberg. We always talk about on MLB Central during the course of the year uh, how the artwork is coming along, and and he'll always say, "Hey, uh, hey, JP, does, uh, does one of one of your daughters have something new to share?" And so we'll we'll get the. Uh, We'll get the artwork up there from my oldest, my seven-year-old or five-year-old. Uh, we'll, we'll sort of take turns. And so I think I have one from each of them right now. So that, right. we have fun with that because that's a little bit of personal uh, yeah. touch to it and, and their own art. And, and certainly for them, they, they have to have a lot of stretches during the course of the year where I might, might be traveling in a way. And so they know that when they see their work on TV, which they don't really watch the shows too often, <laughs> I guess I'll admit, but when they do to them, it's it's unique that they get a chance to, to see their artwork on yeah. you know, on the air. So I think for them, uh, that's maybe how I look at it as the positive side of of, yeah. of me being away is that at least I, I certainly try to give them their own place on the wall. And so when I'm talking about whatever the, the topic du jour is uh, for baseball, that they're they're part of that too. I'm trying to look around, and again, we don't have the the, the big league set up like you usually do. <laughs> and I, I was hoping to have the HD, but no, I get it. Um, and it's funny too because you know when Jeff Passan did that on on Twitter, it was it kind of in a way, it kind of you know, it was disappointing in a, in a way because I'm looking at that thinking, man, I look, look look at this bookshelf. But at the same time, it's kind of cool because I think one thing. And at first, when you start watching, you know, Jimmy Fallon doing his show from the basement, right? 
and all these things. I'm like, ah, man, this is that's it's in a sense, obviously, the time of year and what's happening, it, it, it can be depressing. But at the same time, it's it is really cool to to kind of get an inside look at everyone because everyone's stuck at home, so you're starting to see what everyone's set up now. By the way, I I need some work on a backdrop, man. I need to talk yeah. to someone and get like a, a a sheet or something, at least. Maybe like an, jersey, the Harbour Bridge, Jersey, would be Jersey great. Vega. So yeah, maybe okay. some of uh, maybe some of your Olympic uh, equipment there. Maybe, there maybe an Australia jersey, a Mariner jersey. There'd be a lot of really good things to have back there. You've got a lot of good options, Ryan. Yeah, I know. It's just uh, this is literally the only corner of the room. We're, we're homeschooling. The kids are just running the house. So right. this is like the only corner where I can sit and not get in their way. Yeah, I mean, I had I had Kennedy come in looking for a little her, her little lion. I was talking to Adam Ray. Uh, comedian and he was locked into this story it was such a cool story and kennedy's standing right here and she's like dad i gotta uh, where, where's my line i can't find her. i'm like right i'm right, right. In. Yeah, <laughs> join, exactly. join us I, was I think awesome. we're, all, we're all in that place a little bit right now yeah. ryan where yeah. where the interruptions are are not even really interruptions they're they're just yeah. part of life but in terms of uh, your kids walking in i think it's all understood that it's part of what we're all doing and and uh, every situation is unique uh you know i, I to that extent i suppose from this workspace, I'm, I'm somewhat fortunate that I'm used to working at home and, and used to doing my job from this area. And so from, from that perspective, it's been uh, the flow of work a little more normal for me, I suppose, when, when you put it in that context. But certainly there are, for all of us, there are aspects of life that are very different. Uh, like you, we're trying our best to homeschool. My wife is a doctor, so her job has been very busy right. the last month or so. So we're just, uh, we're just trying to get through it day by day. And I do think, Ryan, that for all of us uh, who – have grown up uh, in a baseball mentality, even those of us that don't play the game, but have been around it uh, in our lives, it does teach you that daily focus. And yeah. I think that that's, yeah. that has been hopefully helpful to us as we go through this time as a, as a global community, that uh, the, the daily nature of the game trains us to think a certain way very methodically as best we can. Obviously, we're, we're all going through uh, difficult times. We all have our good days and bad days, I think, right now. But uh, I, I think that that way of, of, of approaching life is helpful. And I also think mm -hmm. that whenever baseball comes back, and we still don't know when it's going to come back, but whenever it does, and I believe uh, I'm, I'll be optimistic and say that it will this year, uh, whenever it does, the, the daily nature of it is going to be helpful because it will give us yeah. that tentpole part of our day that yeah. is something that we can look forward to and, and really share that, frankly, does not exist quite in the same daily right. ritual with the other sports. Yeah, no, you're right. You get so caught up and life moves so fast, especially obviously, you know, for you um, and, and everyone else. But it, it gives does give you a chance if you want to see that silver lining just to sort of sit back and say, look, I can spend more time at home. I can interact, you know, with kids or whatever it may be. Now, speaking of baseball coming back, and I get this asked all the time, is baseball coming back? Apparently, they said May. And I said, hey, I'll be honest with you. I said, hey, go follow Morosi on Twitter. He'll have the answer for you. Because you said your wife is in the mix, right? She, she's yeah. got, you know, some, some inside information. Is there any chance baseball back in May, in, in your opinion? Uh, it's a great question, Ryan. And, and I guess the, the quick answer is, I don't know. I don't think anybody really knows yeah. for sure yet. Uh, but but I do hope, and, and, it's, and I will underline the word hope, um, that certainly and I'm reading the same news that you are. And, and it's interesting because I'll, I'll tell my wife what I hope will happen. And sometimes she'll just kind of raise her eyebrows at me as if to say, John, you realize what I do for a living. <laughs> and and, uh, and you're, you're welcome to render these sports-related opinions, uh, but – you know, obviously there, there are things that she sees yeah. every day that inform her perspective on things. So um, it's a it's a it's a difficult balance to strike for everybody involved, obviously. But I do think this, Ryan, and, and I've, I've reflected on this the last week or so, and, and I've settled settled in this in this basic spot with it, that we're going to have to be flexible. Everybody, we mm -hmm. anybody involved in the game, fans, media, and certainly most importantly, the executives and the players that are involved in it, and everybody involved in the ballparks and operationally speaking, mm -hmm. uh, will have to be flexible. And I don't think whenever this is decided that we're going to have an announcement from MLB and the union that says, listen, here's how the next six months are going to go, chapter mm -hmm. and verse, everything laid out for us. Yeah. I, I just don't think that coronavirus has told us what's going to be okay to do during that amount of time right. they? i think that we're we're still we're still finding our way through this obviously and and, and it's being experienced at different rates and different peaks all around the country and the mm -hmm. world so it's really difficult to 
to pinpoint exactly when and where we're going to be able to play. But I do believe this, Ryan. I, I think that that if we can play safely, whether it's in one location or two locations or three locations, uh, according to various reports that, that are in play, whether it's Florida, Texas, Arizona, whatever yeah. it ends up being, um, that if we can play for three months and that if on the – that if on the, the, the first day when this is discussed, that if the commissioner or, or others that are involved in the, in the planning mm-hmm. get up in front of everybody and say, listen, here's our plan, but we're going to have to be flexible as it relates to the fall, especially because we don't know if there's going to be a second spike. We're not sure what's going to happen. Yeah. That, that I, I think we all have to be OK, Ryan, with not with not knowing. And we're, I think we're comfortable right now with not knowing because we don't really know a yeah. week, two weeks out in any, in any respect. So I think that if we can have a, a, a regular season even for a few months and not even know what the playoffs are going to bring, not even know what's going to be feasible from that public health standpoint, I still think that baseball is therefore playing its role. I, yeah. I, I think that in many ways, getting back on the field, playing every day from where I sit, from what I feel, that, that chunk of three months or however long it goes – I think is more important than saying, okay, well, the World Series has to be this number of games hosted in this city because we yeah. just don't know that yet. I think yeah. it's, it's, it's important to just find a way when it's safe to do so to just get back and, and share that time together. What, what do you think about MLB? You know, do, do you feel like it's a good tactic on their part to come out at, well, I mean, you know, a couple of weeks ago and say, uh, we're shooting for May? Because I feel like, you know, if the president comes out or, you know, a governor comes out and gives a date or a deadline or something, it always backfires. Do you think it's it's smart for MLB to say, oh, mate, th- this is when we're shooting for, because if it doesn't happen, p- they're going to get criticized and, and everything else? Because no one, like you said, no one does know. Right. Well, I, I think it was just, at the time it was reported first by, by Jeff Passan, as you mentioned it, it was it was an idea and a concept. It wasn't yeah. as though this was the this was the date that they were going to rally around and say, "Hey, listen, it's got to start on this day." Yeah. Uh, I, I think the 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 month of May, at least as we're speaking here today, um, as we near near the end of April, is is relevant insofar as that is when the prohibition against gatherings beyond a certain number of people from the CDC is still, as we speak today, due to expire around the middle of the month. And yeah. so, and so, therefore, from a national perspective, you would at least have the the legal footing to to have a practice. And and I think that's that's the big question is is once you are legally permitted to do so by the the CDC's guidelines, then what do you do? Then then is it acceptable to work in small groups? And and to the extent that there is obviously very little precedent, almost no precedent for what we're experiencing here in the U.S. We are watching our colleagues in Asia go through this in real right. time, and I'm sure MLB and the union are, are taking notes on this subject, uh, how things are going with the CPBL in Taiwan, how it's going with yeah. the KBO in Korea. And I, I did think it was interesting. Joel Sherman wrote this week in the New York Post. Uh, he spoke with Hank Conger, who, a former major league player, is now a coach in Korea, about how the, the different protocols you must go through as a player get to the ballpark, right. temperature checks. The, the, have your mask with you when you get there. But interestingly, Joel's story did say that once the players got into the clubhouse and then onto the field, that it, that it was a degree of solace. Uh, certainly, you did see umpires and other personnel wearing masks, yeah. but that once you got to the field, there was a threat of normalcy, which I think is is very comforting to hear. Yeah, you know, it's funny you mentioned the the CPBL. You're talking about and try, um, yeah, baseball in Taiwan. I played there, and I got a couple of friends. I was texting them and saying, "Hey, look, you know, how's it all going?" And they're like, "Hey, ratings are through the roof. People are loving it." So yeah. I, I was looking at that model because you know you're talking about not having fans, um, you know, in the seats, and and the talk about you know Arizona and Florida. A couple things with that, and you know, I got off, I got off with Justin Dunn. He's in he, he, young prospect with the Mariners. He's in Arizona at the moment. He's just talking about oh, it's starting to get hot. I couldn't imagine these guys playing in the heat, right, in Arizona, or even the other the other part of this is too is is this something that everyone's going to get excited about to watch? You know the Red Sox play at their spring training, or, or even if let's say you keep it all in Arizona, and you've got yeah you know, the Yankee a- aesthetically pleasing factor is not there. The fact that you're watching your team play at Fenway, the noise of the crowd, all these little things that when you're viewing a game that you love so much to watch your your Red Sox or, or you know your Mariners playing at, at T-Mobile Park, you don't have these things. So I just think there is and and as much I want to see baseball like crazy, we all do. 
but just the just the different elements, how different it will be to compromise is, and it's just something you wonder: is this going to backfire? You know, you know what I'm saying? Because in Taiwan, there's only a couple. There's only four. The logistics are a lot different. There's only you know a handful of teams, and they all, they can all play in their stadium. The the commutes are close. Taiwan's a lot smaller than the U.S. Right. Well, I think one of the key points, Ryan, and that's a, it's a very well reasoned point about just the, the challenges logistically that exist for a yeah. 30 team league spread across the country versus a smaller leagues in a, yeah. in a smaller geographic area. I, I think first and foremost, the commissioner has said that they're not going to begin play until they know that it's safe to do so from a public mm-hmm. health standpoint. And right. also just as importantly, that they're not taking away any resources to take care of the, the population at large. So yeah. that means that, that baseball is not going to compromise the bandwidth, to use the word, of of the healthcare system to care for those who are right. who are ill from from, yeah. from the novel coronavirus. So I think that's number one. So that that's that's the first piece of it. But the the, the question that you bring up logistically, uh, um, in terms of playing in the heat, if if you if you were to in this circumstance, which is obviously uh, so far from optimal that it, that it's difficult to even put into words, that that if you could consider a site. Or multiple sites where you have that that three step plan. Ken Rosenthal's written about this, where maybe you have Florida, Texas, and Arizona all active. Mm-hmm. You could envision a scenario whereby the earlier games are in Florida, and maybe they're indoors. When you think about Miami and Tampa yeah. Bay, depending how things go, um, yeah. and you you can utilize some spring training facilities. But there's probably a way using the the, the natural time zones of the U.S. Mm-hmm. to stagger the times of the games. So that way you're playing either in domes right. or at night in, in relatively temperature controlled gotcha. situations. And if you do it east, central, mountain to Pacific, then you actually have a chance to for there to be baseball a lot of hours of the day. And, mm-hmm. and if, if you can be creative about where and when, how you stagger the yeah. games, you, you can actually, first and foremost, have live games on a lot of the hours of the day. Uh, and evening, of course, mm-hmm. and then also um, on the other dynamic of things, you're able to take care of the players and make sure that they're not oppressively in the heat uh, for too yeah. much time. That's a great point. Staggering the games that way, you know, if you if if you're watching the team on the West, Coast, I always think about this. If we're playing the Red Sox or the Yankees on the on the West Coast, if you if you're trying to tune in to watch your team, it's ten o'clock at night. <laughs> right, <laughs> like, right. It's a challenge. And, yeah, yeah. And even from a rating standpoint on on TV, radio, if you are a West Coast team, you lose half the country because everyone's asleep by the time you you kick off that prime time game at seven p.m. Right, right. Well, yeah. And, and certainly, I, I do think Ryan, we're we're going through a time as well where our rhythm, rhythms and routines are different now. We're yeah. we're working maybe at different hours of the day. Uh, we're able to maybe take more time in the in the daytime. I suppose if you know if you're if you're working. Uh, but your team is on and it's one o'clock in the afternoon, you could probably flip it on behind you. You're, you, you've got, you're watching yeah. it and, and you're aware of what's going on. So I, I think all right. we're all consuming things in such a different way now that, that I think having those, those moments of connection that, that are, that go along with watching a game. And I think that's also where the, those experiences that we're now seeing where you've got a, a second screen, if you will, your, your phone or, or uh, a tablet and you're watching the game. I, I think yeah. we're going to see a lot of those, conversational elements where just being able ryan to talk with uh, a parent talk with uh, your sibling a friend about a game uh, who's living in a different place right. uh yeah. just those those connections uh you could have the game on here and then you're talking on the phone uh, or or what, what you know visual talking I mean, there's a lot of different ways to to do that that i think are are creative and i, I yeah. think speak to the ingenuity that we're all seeing across the country and the world right now have you done the, the, the family meetups on Zoom or Skype? Yes, or? <laughs> yes, yes, it's been fun. Yeah, we, we yeah. had one over the weekend. It's great. Uh, you know, it's a novelty, and re- yeah. Yeah, it is. And, yeah. and even, you know, I, I had uh, recently one of my uh, roommate uh, groups from, from college. We all got together. It was one of our, yeah. uh, actually, two of my roommates had a birthday. We toasted them. So uh, there's, there are interesting ways that we are, we are all adapting. And in some ways, it's giving us new reason to reconnect with folks that we maybe haven't talked to in a long time. Absolutely. Because, because you know, as we're adhering to the guidelines, if it doesn't matter if they're in Italy or next door. You're still talking to them through a screen. So yeah. uh, I think from, from that standpoint, it's created a lot, of, uh, a lot of unique opportunities to connect in the midst of what is obviously still a very difficult time. 
Yeah, you're right. I mean, I've, I've had a chance. We've done three of them now. Every Friday night, my friends, it's Saturday afternoon in Australia. Boom. We yeah. Get on Zoom. It's, it's a blast. And I'm like, I haven't spoke to you guys this much ever. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it, since I've spent my time in the States. But, hey, look, you talk about, you know, obviously we talked about the CPBL. I want to talk to you about something that you seem very passionate about. And this is something, my background coming from Australia, international baseball. And you and I got a chance to spend some time in, in uh, Japan in November um, watching the, the Olympic qualifiers. I'm a, I'm a huge advocate, not because I'm from Australia. I'm a huge advocate for, for the world game, right? What, what is it for you? Why, when the WBC rolls around, you're always you know, on, the, on the top step, you know, given, you know, given the information, getting it out there and pushing it. Why are you such a big advocate for the international game? Well, Ryan, it's a great question. It, it's, it's something that fits with how I view the importance of sports in the world as a, as a way to connect with people. And, and you've learned this throughout your own career and your own life experience in the game, that we can learn so much about each other by mm -hmm. watching the sports of other countries and how they play the sports, how their yeah. fans celebrate the sports and that to me is one of the most powerful tools where if, if you're meeting someone for the first time and you know a couple of the big baseball clubs or soccer clubs in in their country and you can have that immediate connection yeah. there's magic in that there there is magic Absolutely. in that at a time when um it's even it was true even before this ryan but i think now uh when you consider how COVID-19 has changed our, our world and, and our social interactions, what it's going to be like just to have conversations with, with people that we haven't met before uh, yeah. in the future. A lot of these things that we're thinking about and, and learning about, that the ability to, to connect with home by, by mentioning the name of a team or a player and you get a smile and then all of a sudden there's a connection. Yeah. I, I've just found to be one of the more magical things that I've experienced in life. And so I, I, I want to keep reliving those interesting connections uh, whenever I meet someone new from a new place. And I also love seeing the value that it brings the interactions for other people. And that even, even includes the players. It, it's incredible, Ryan, and you know this, how many people, when they get a chance to experience a WBC, they, they come away wanting more because it's such yeah. a unique team dynamic. The national team, we don't think about it as much in baseball as you do in, in soccer and so many other sports where, who, who is on the national team is a perpetual conversation. The national team, if you want to have a big conversation, uh, if you're speaking with someone from Italy or from Spain, yeah. hey, what's the starting level going to be from our, for our soccer team? And yeah. then, there goes the next hour of debate about why exactly. this person is better than the other. 100%. And, and we don't quite have that, that same discussion point for, for baseball in our country very, very often. So when it does happen, it's really unique. And I also think, Ryan, just for me, I, you know, I – I've got a lot of close connections to Italy, certainly proud Italian American. And, and, and so to, to see Italy play in the, in the, in the world baseball classic yeah. and on the world stage always gives me a lot of pride. And, and, and I always watch that team play with, with a great deal of interest and, and fascination. And, and, and really the story is just incredible. You think about how uh, the areas of Italy where the game is played most loyally are those areas where U S military was stationed after world war two. And, and there had to nice. be at, at that time, how do we find a way to come together and, and get used to this new normal? Well, the way was baseball and, yeah. and the American service members teaching the game to the Italian locals. And here we are all these years later, yeah. it's still played in Italy as a result. So it's, so those, those are the connections and those are the stories that I find incredibly welcoming. And I guess the final, final note that I'll say on that part is, is certainly learning Spanish has been a big part of my life and I, I've, I've right. dedicated a lot of time to it. And so many of my best teachers are the players. And so uh, the chance to experience baseball in Mexico, in Puerto Rico, in Cuba uh, years ago when, when MLB went there, uh, it's very special. And so the language component of that, to, to experience the, the Latin American game in Spanish is such a powerful one. And uh, it's one that always makes me smile and, and one that yeah. I hope to share with my, with my wife and my kids as well. You know, you make a you make a good point when you experience you know international baseball. A lot of those kids in in, in November when we're covering the Olympic qualifiers from Team USA, all of a sudden they're they're in the Tokyo Dome. And they're seeing and they're just blown away. But it's a completely different style, whether it's from the viewership or or from the way the game's played and everything else. It's amazing when you do actually step into it and go, "Whoa, this game is different." You know, around different countries. Yeah, it, it's amazing. You mentioned soccer as well, right? The World Cup of soccer is the biggest. I mean, it's one of the. It's. 
I mean, I could argue the top three sporting event in the world where these guys, all of a sudden, these superstars with, you know, huge contracts and the whole thing, just like baseball, all of a sudden, boom, off they go. Kind of like Olympic hockey kind of used to be. It's changed a little bit now. And it was so special to see them representing their country. What would it take for baseball to get to that level, do you think, when you're talking like the World Cup of soccer where, you know, these the, these players are all, every single superstar in the big leagues is playing for their country? It's a great question, Ryan. And I think we're getting really close. Uh, and when you consider the, the that question, I think, really strikes at the U.S. team first and foremost, uh, because, the as you know, the best Japanese players play, the best Korean yeah. players play. Uh, you think about uh, the best Dominican players have usually been playing. They won the championship in 2013. Uh, the best Venezuelan players are almost always there. There's always uh, the question of pitching here and there, depending on uh, if the pitcher is coming off a of especially long season. Yeah. Uh, maybe they pitched in the World Series. It's kind of hard for them to get turned back around and, and yeah. ready for, for the earlier spring. So I really think that it, it, the question pertains mostly to pitching and mostly – really specifically to American pitching right. because uh, a lot of the, the top pitchers around the world do find a way to get on the roster. You think about uh, the, the Colombian team, uh, you had Jose Quintana and Julio Tehran pitching for them in, in 2017. They, they darn near beat the U S in the first game yeah. of, that, of that tournament. So, uh, so a lot of the best players around the world do pitch a lot of the best, a lot, a lot of the, they either play or pitch depending on the circumstance. And I think with, with team USA, you had a pretty good club position player wise. Yes, there was no trout last time around, but, you think about that lineup, you had Arenado and, and Yelich. Uh, you had Adam Jones the second time. Uh, you had Stanton and McCutcheon, yeah. Posey, Lucroy. It's Hosmer. It was hard to find many places where where you were not having one of your better players in the league at that position. So it was maybe only a matter of a couple of players. And I get it that if, if Trout and Kershaw and Harper were on the team last time around, there's a little different tenor right. to everything. But I think overall, the fact the U.S. won, uh, I think sent a pretty strong message. And I believe that it seems like, Ryan, every four years, the quality of the roster gets better and better and better. And I would expect that it'll be much the same here uh, going forward for the next WBC. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, you make a good point. Team USA is on board. I feel like not the rest of the world's on board, but all of a sudden viewership and, and the epicenter of baseball all of a sudden catches on. And I feel like, too, you, you make a good point. Every time this WBC rolls around, that U.S. team gets stronger and stronger. And it's a, it's a peer thing. I, you know, I think if, if Bryce Harper and Trout – see their buddies on that team and they come back and man, it was a blast. It was so good wearing, you know, the USA uniform all of a sudden they're like, okay, I'll, I'll give this a crack. Speaking of that, the biggest, you know, hiccup with this is the time of year, right? Spring training. Is there a better time of year where this could, this could happen? It's a great question, Ryan. I, I do think that eventually we'll see the finals happen around the all-star break. I don't know how soon that would happen. It's been talked about for a while that maybe logistically speaking, we would see that. Of course, that would involve the, the league in Japan stopping their season and yeah. if, if Japan qualifies for the finals. But I, I think the optimal, when, when you really get to the epic level of the WBC getting that renown around the world, you would play the preliminary rounds uh, maybe in March, mm -hmm. uh, and then you would have the semis and finals, or maybe even the quarters yeah. and semis and finals, during one big week or so in the summer. Because that, to me, is where you would really get a bunch of eyeballs on this. Of course, March, typically, yeah. and uh, I guess I'll have a parenthetical here, we don't know what our sports schedule will look like in, in this country for the next 12, 18 months, necessarily, uh, in terms of when we're going to see different seasons popping up. But in general, in March, you, you are competing against uh, NCAA tournament and other, other sports that are still going. You've got NBA and NHL are going. Whereas the summertime, I've always been a big believer that, that you can't make the All-Star break long enough from a standpoint of marketing, that if, that if you stopped your league for a week and you and you put in some international games there, whether it's WBC or even I've, I've thought and had the idea before to have an international friendly, if you will. So the, the, the day after the All-Star game or the day before, depending on how you want to do it in conjunction with the Home Run Derby maybe, uh, but you would have a – because you've already got all the stars there anyway – if you played the U.S. national team against the Dominican national team, and you can call it a friendship game, whatever you want to call it, like a friendly like you would see yeah. in soccer, can you imagine the passion you would see there? I, I still say oh, yeah. one of my favorite sporting events ever was the U.S.-Dominican game in Miami when uh, the Dominican came back and won it late right. and Nelson Cruz's home run, and, and just my ears are still ringing three years later from that game. So I, yeah. I, I think those those types of moments, they're just they're just so great, right? There's, yeah. we, we talk a lot about baseball. 
where the game is and ways to improve it. If you if you were at Marlins Park for the U.S. Dominican game and the U.S. Columbia game and also the Columbia Dominican game, which was in some ways just as dramatic as anything else, you walked out of that ballpark saying, "Perfect, baseball yeah. is perfect. Right. It, it is it is passionate. It is loud. It is musical. There is this there is this soul to it that's so that's so beautiful. We don't need to change." a darn thing or apologize for a darn thing yeah. about this sport because it's so beautiful. And in those moments where the, where the passion comes out on the field, uh, you, there's, there's not even a need to put any advertisement for the game beyond yeah. just watching that game. And then that tells you all you need to know. Uh, that, yeah, that's, that's a great point. I think the other thing that, that if you can get people to latch onto is the fact it's, it's tournament style baseball. It's so mm-hmm. different to a regular season, so different to having it to, to, you know, figure out your pitching rotation. It's just, it's all or nothing in those pool play games. And it's that one chance where you get to, you may run into that one pitcher on that. If you haven't, you know, got that strategy down with that pool play, you're going to run into that guy. You're not, you're not going through the next round. I think that makes it a, a, a really good point. You mentioned the middle of summer. And, and one thing I played in the Olympics in 2004 and one of my best memories like ever but I had to explain here in the U.S. a lot of times. Not explain, but everyone would say, "Well, the U.S. the the best players can't play," and there was always that you know that little stain on, on on it for me. I'll admit we won a silver medal. We 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 beat Japan. Japan had their all star team. They they stopped their season to send them over. And ever since, I was like, man, I wish you could grow on on the Olympic level, but you just can't see it happening. There's just too many moving pieces, you know, for it to happen where the best players could play at the Olympics. Well, maybe you would say maybe in Los Angeles when it's in 2028, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's obviously a long way from now. We don't know what next week is looking like. Um, so it's hard to really uh, get too much of a picture about what the L.A. Olympics could look like. But that will be on U.S. soil. Uh, one never knows where the where the WBC cycles are falling at that point in time. And, and, and the overall movement, of course, that's going to be a, a, an issue for for labor relations to be handled uh, going forward. But I, I do know there's, there's a lot of interest among players in going. I think players would like to play. I, I remember when I asked Bryce Harper, and it was a couple of years ago, about Chris Bryant, his relationship with, with Chris. Of course, they grew up on the same travel ball teams in Las Vegas. And Bryce, I, I asked him about playing together. This is, I think he was still a national. And so there was the question yeah. may have been a little bit loaded on my part because I was kind of asking, okay, do you, you want to play with Chris Bryant? But he, he would have had the chance to sign with the Cubs some number of months later. <laughs> and, and Bryce just kind of smiled. He said, hey, I've always been saying in the Olympics. And so wow. it was on Bryce's mind. And, and that was obviously in a conversation I think a, couple of, a couple of years ago now. But uh, it's interesting to, to note that at least in that moment, Bryce was yeah. thinking about it. Maybe he'll play in the WBC next time around. But to be honest with you, and this is no disrespect to Bryce, I, that's a crowded outfield. I, yeah. So, who, who, so that's, if you're going to pick the best three American outfielders right now, so Christian Yelich played last time was great and has won an MVP since then. I think it's hard to knock him off the team. If Trout wants to play, hard to yeah. say no to Trout. And then Mookie Betts has won an MVP here recently. So, uh, and Bellinger, by the way, yeah. you're going to put Bellinger in center or right, or you know, center yeah. right or first. So, so there's a lot of different thoughts there. Where if if Bellinger and Yelich and Mookie and Trout and Harper all want to play. Good luck in terms of making the actual outfield, which is what it should be. It's just, it should Absolutely. be one of those great debates that we have. And, yeah. and, and maybe uh, if we have to wait for baseball to come around, maybe we go back and pick what the, what the WBC roster would have looked like with Willie Mickey and the Duke and all these different guys from 60 yeah. years ago, how, how that would have yeah. been. Because you go back in time and there would have been some pretty amazing all-star teams among uh, American-born players at different generations of time. You make such a good point. I mean, you're talking Bryce Harper waiting by the phone to see if he if he made the roster. That's how good that right. team could be. Right. And that's that. Like you said, you know, you mentioned with the, with the the soccer World Cup when you're talking about you know with, with some of these European countries, you can spend an hour talking about that best roster. That's and that's the kind of intrigue that international baseball could bring, especially from the WBC level. Now, you mentioned a couple of historic players. Now, I've been following along to the MLB dream bracket, right? You and Scott Braun, basically, now, I, there's a, I've got a couple different different things on this when you talk about game simulation and everything else, because because everyone everyone's dying for baseball, okay? How much, now, just to, actually, I'll let you explain, what exactly is this dream bracket you and Scott Braun are doing at the moment? Well, Ryan, thanks for asking. It's been a lot of fun. So uh, 
MLB Network, MLB.com. Uh, there's a DraftKings is involved in, in, in promoting as well and, and sponsoring it. It's a very unique uh, program run through out of the park baseball with with their roster simulation uh, software, basically, where, where you're, you're going to compile a roster and then play it out in a in a playoff series format. And okay, okay, so, so I wanted to ask you that. So the rosters are built from software. Well, they were chosen. Uh, I'm not exactly sure who was involved in the in the roster selection process. Because uh, I have all, I have a couple names yeah, here. I was looking yeah. at the rosters. I was like, hold on a second, and a, yeah, a couple yeah. a couple. So, anyway, continue. Yeah, so it was, all, so was all time great rosters selected. I, I believe there was a committee that that put the actual rosters there. Uh, I, I did not personally pick the rosters, but but I, I've been enjoying <laughs> learning about the players. Uh, and so uh, we, we've had the rosters, and so we study up the rosters and then see how the games unfold. And, and, and the simulations are quick. The game has been about a half hour. And, and it's amazing how you see the, the different encounters. It's really kind of allowed us to learn about some players that I really didn't know about too much uh, growing up. And, and uh, some of my favorite details, Lou Boudreau, for example, with, with Cleveland, he was a player manager at the age of 24. And when he right. was 30, he was the MVP of the American League, and he won the World Series as a manager at 30. He was the manager and a player at age 30. So I, I feel quite lazy in in uh, in comparison to Lou Boudreau. So a lot of different great numbers. Joe Morgan, we're looking this up, uh, his, his career, 800 more walks than strikeouts. Uh, just incredible numbers for, for so and, and so many players, and certainly we, we had known well about uh, Boudreau Hall of Famer, Joe Morgan Hall of Famer, but even just some great players that maybe weren't in the Hall, learning more about them has been really neat. So it's it's been a, a, a fascinating study for me. Uh, and and just to, to be in back in the rhythm of calling games, Scott's fantastic, and yeah. our our crew at, uh, at at MLB Network's just done a great job of putting it on as well. So just uh, some great people and, and a really fun uh, group of people to really work with and collaborate over. Because I've I've seen you know, on social media, you flash those lineups up, and there's a ton of criticism. I mean, I remember. Sure. That- yeah, and that's why I needed to ask him, like, who's coming up with these rosters? Is it a computer system with, you know, with some algorithm that I can't comprehend? Or is it is it JP sitting there saying, oh, I think this guy, this guy? Yeah, because so the, the, go ahead. yeah the, the lineups are not mine. So we are <laughs> we are presented the lineups from, from the virtual manager. Uh, and so I, 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 will, I was at times uh, joking about uh, how we were going to maybe see the lineup moved around. And, and you, you consider, well, how do you even put? Jeter and DiMaggio, Mantle, Ruth, Gehrig, Reggie Jackson. Good luck figuring out what that top six will be. Alex Rodriguez, you put him in there at third base, uh, how, how that team looks. And, and I think in the in the Seattle Yankees matchup, you've got A-Rod on both teams, which is okay. Right. So you can, yeah. have, you can have A-Rod on both teams. So it's <laughs> it's a very unique uh, system, and, and we, we've really enjoyed – uh, talking through the different scenarios and 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 yeah, Joe DiMaggio. Uh, I think he only batted third or fourth for the Yankees uh, in in the real world. But then, how do you handle it when you've got to put him in there yeah, with okay. Jeter and Ruth and Gehrig and Jackson? I, I was even reminded just looking at the at Reggie's career. I had forgotten that he had actually won more championships with Oakland than he won with the Yankees. But you think about him as a Yankee, yeah, he actually right. played more games with with Oakland and the Angels. So it's those little storylines that have that have been really fun to learn about and and. Uh, I put a smile on my face every day learning about it. Yeah, I noticed you know Reggie Jackson pop up on a couple of different uh, rosters. Has anyone popped up on three different rosters, or it's usually two? A Rod. So I think A Rod okay. is on Texas Yankees and the you're Mariners, right, and uh, <laughs> so that, that's a very interesting. I mean, th- to have that kind of a career where you're yeah. that significant to all those franchises, and, and even too, you think about the different teams. Uh, our, our Keith Costas looked this up. Uh, the number about how many? I think it was ten players all time have played a thousand or more games for two teams. That's a pretty interesting stat. And yeah. Joe Morgan actually played a thousand games with Houston before going to Cincinnati bonds, of course, who yeah. uh, So a lot of those all time uh, scenarios where, where you're really looking at their, their careers and, and re- reflecting on that. And, and you also reminded Ryan about how fast time goes. We are now almost, almost a full decade since pools last game with the Cardinals. His last year there was 2011. I and, still, and I'm in, I'm, right? I cover, I cover an AL West team. I still look at him as a, as a St. Louis Cardinal and I, right. you know, and, and nothing against the angels and hey, happy for him. He signed his deal with them, but I still look at him as saying he's a Cardinal, but like the, the, you know, those last couple of years, he, he, he latched onto another team, which is crazy when you, when you just mentioned that it's, you know, been what a decade. Right. And that's, and that to me is, is one of the unique things about the game is that your mind a little bit with time 
Yeah. Plays tricks on you in terms of how long ago certain things were and, and, and which uniform you most associate a certain player with. And and it could be just their biggest moments were there. Uh, like Reggie's a great example. I think we would always think of Reggie as a Yankee, uh, unless you're probably an A's fan or an Angels fan. And with Albert, even though he's now almost played as many games uh, with the Angels as the Cardinals, it's it's hard for me just from having covered those playoff runs. I was there. I covered the 06 World Series. And, and then the 11 playoffs, which were amazing in so many ways. That, that, that whole journey, I remember that 2011 season, uh, the, I was covering at the end of September. I was doing more writing then than I, than I am now. And I was writing about the, the Red Sox. I was in Baltimore for that game. Uh, I, I was covering the game where Crawford missed the ball in left field. And then a second later, Longoria hit the home run. And I remember the, the, the connectedness of that night because uh, Longoria hit the home run uh, in 2011 to clinch the division over the Red Sox. He yeah. hit the home run over and over a little notch there, Tropicana field, which you probably remember down in mm -hmm. left field. Well, they had built that notch a couple years previous. So Carl Crawford could make exciting catches when he was a member of the Rays. Wow. And so now this That's notch nice. is still there in the field. They hadn't taken it out. Yeah. And the notch is where the ball goes over off of Longoria's bat to give the division title to the Rays over Crawford's Red Sox in the final game for Terry Francona there with Boston. So just an incredible series of events. And, and then you, you project forward in, in the decade and how many, on how many small moments did, did the whole sport turn? Because yeah. then Bobby Valentine goes in there for just one year and John Farrell comes in and they won, they win the world series in 2013. So just the amount of uh, reflections going back on the decade, pretty, uh, pretty incredible to really think about the number of different actors we've had uh, at play starring roles. Yeah, you, you, speaking of that, and, and one you know, opportunity for some of these regional, like here at Root Sports, they're showing all these old Mariner games, you know, and every time, you know, they had the 2001 opening day, right? And you, you listen to the broadcast, and at that point, they didn't quite know how good that team was going to be, 116 right. wins. Um, yeah, and then and you, you had a tweet talking about the 03, 2004, you know, Red, um, you know, the Red Sox the covering Red Sox, that. Yes, yes. And, you know, it, first of all, it, it, it is a good opportunity to – to watch games, you know, in different in different eras, and and I want to ask you this. And speaking of that, uh, baseball is so it's now okay to wave the white flag for a GM to say we are rebuilding, basically telling the fan base early on we're going to strip it down, and they can word it however they want. Yeah, you know, I know, you know, obviously Jerry Depoto up here in Seattle, you know, calls it a, pressing the reset button or whatever it is. And you've been covering baseball, you know, a lot longer than I've been involved, or I, you know, half the time I didn't really pay attention, um, you know, to baseball, you know, back then to to this degree. At what point do you feel like baseball made that that shift? Because I feel like when I'm watching these old games, every team didn't matter how much money you had or what kind of roster you had, you were going in. This is the best we got. We have to try and win this year, right? At what point did it kind of change to say, ah, this year we're just kind of we're, we're pushing for three years down the track? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think, Ryan, that the, the availability of information to the public, to fans, mm. about yeah. what a rebuild looks like and how acceptable it is was a major shift. And I don't think it was done intentionally. I think it was just organic. That, and I remember, so the one year I spent covering the Mariners back in 05, uh, that was uh, Bill Bavese was the GM. They were going through a bit of a rebuild. I remember they traded that year. Randy Wynn at the deadline. Uh, they made a couple other moves. Uh, Boone was released that year. It was just there was a, it was a time when you could tell things were not going to be a quick fix for them in terms of getting right back to it uh, yeah. and, and winning the division that year or even the next. But I, I think in general, when when t I remember covering that team that year and, and getting a lot of feedback. Uh, various fan blogs and websites that were that were out at the time and really kind of that early 2000s baseball blogosphere i think was really kind of coming into its own as as a yeah. real sharp analytical i think construction of of what fandom looks like now mm -hmm. and the more the more that that writers and the more that fans became literate about decision making wins above replacement win curves whatever you want to call yeah. it yeah. The more fluent they got in those areas, the more they wrote about it, and the more fans read that and said, you know what, I'm not going to say, hey, I want my team to go for it in the way that a high school football coach would tell his players to go for it. It's not the same yeah. mentality. It says, listen, let's look at the standings. Let's calculate our our win probability added here or what we've got, yeah. what our chances are to, to, uh, to, to win the division. 
and and let's look around and say, listen, we're, we're not going to win the division this year, so let's make some trades. And yep. and before that, there used to be, to your point, I think a degree of embarrassment in, in making moves like right. that. But okay. once I think once fans got aware of the process in, in a real literal sense and saw it work for teams like the Cubs, like the Astros, um, and, and even before that, a team like the Rays getting into the World Series in 2008, yeah. that there were enough surprising results that, that fans began to seize upon, okay, look, this works. So when my team does something that I know works, I will applaud them. It doesn't matter if it if our record is is 57 wins and a whole bunch of losses. Mm-hmm. If I'm seeing that my team is, is putting protocols into place that will allow them to build a 97-win team, I'm okay with yeah. that. I'm okay with focusing on prospects in the minor leagues because I realize that in, if for this team right now, if you're not winning at the major league level, those players – are more important to your future yeah. than the veterans who are on your major league roster. So I, I think it's there's been a, a, a change in, and I think it's, Ryan, honestly, I think it's come a lot from fans and their acceptance of what competitive baseball looks like. It's, competitive baseball is not in today's game today. It's how do I build the best sustainable long-term organization? It's, it's, those are Oftentimes those two things align, but sometimes mm-hmm. they don't. And I think yeah. that we're just seeing fans understand that that it's not about that that quick fix of how can I win a game today, but about yeah. how do I build the best sustainable team for the future. Right, and and yeah, you you mentioned the Cubs. I remember I was with the Cubs in 2012, and and Theo Epstein walked in and basically publicly said, and this is this is really you know in 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 my time, watching a big market team, a guy walk in and say this is not the plan to his to his team in that clubhouse at Mesa. This is not what I'm here for, I'm here for five years from now, basically, or three years from now, whatever it is. And everyone's like, and even from the fan base, but that was a big market team. It was a situation where it's like, well, we're the Cubs. We don't do that. We're not the Tampa Bay Rays or, or the Oakland A's. We don't, we, you know, we can just go out and buy players and, and, and do that. I just think it's one of these things and, and, you know, to watch these teams. And I feel like, I don't know what percentage, and you might be able to answer this question. What percentage of teams I feel like there's more and more every year are in the rebuilding phase for two, three years from now. And what percentage of teams are actually going for it this year? That's a great question. I mean, I think that certainly that number is the number of teams you saw this past winter cycling Mm -hmm. into the competitive phase. Some teams that made some big signings, Toronto, the White Sox, the Reds, uh, the Angels with Rendon. Uh, So I think this past winter you saw more teams becoming increasingly comfortable with going for it. Yeah. And I also think, Ryan, that there's – and this probably speaks to the way that people have evolved and the way that, that society has changed. I think the modern player – and you would know better than me because you, you've lived this lifestyle and, and your livelihood. I, the modern player – there may have been a time in the past when, when this commitment of, of, uh, of certain objectives and win totals for this year – we're really important to, to work on and, and we're going to hit this benchmark. And then if I hit this benchmark, that's, yep. uh, that's a good year or I'll get paid X and Y or Z amount of money. I, I think now, Ryan, one of the more important currencies is honesty. If you tell a player in a rebuilding situation, listen, we, we don't expect to be competing for a championship this year, but what we have is opportunity. We have outstanding coaching. We're going to help you be the best player you can be. We're going to compensate you well, obviously, and, and, are you and talking your overall about, amenities are going to be important. Are you talking about if, if you're talking to that 32-year-old who knows he's not part of this rebuild, but he's on that roster? Is that what, is that what you, I, I think that, that, that what, what I believe, Ryan, is that now more than ever, and maybe younger people, I think, want to be communicated with a little differently and maybe more regularly than, than the grizzled veterans yeah. that we would have been reading about and hearing about in, in the 1980s as kids. And I, and I think there's probably that that knowledge that you have to communicate well and thoroughly and honestly because we're in such a transparent time. Yeah. You know, players are you know players can after the game is over, you, you get out your phone and flip on Twitter and you're seeing what yeah. everybody's saying for better or worse. Uh, the media commentary. It's all we're all accountable to each other here. We're all somewhat swimming in the same waters when it comes to media information perception. It's all it's all out there. So in that environment, it makes it so important to be honest. Players, and you know, you know better than me, Ryan, but I think they, they want to know where they stand. Don't tell yeah. me that I'm on the team if I'm not really on the team. If, if I have to compete for a roster spot, I'm okay with that, but just tell me what the deal is. And, and I think that 
the best teams, I believe, are those that have robust, honest communication. Mm -hmm. And you can honestly do that, Ryan, in something of an older school way or a newer school way. I think that the way that yeah. uh, the, the, the Royals, for example, they're a team that certainly don't don't let anybody fool you. They had a very robust analytics department, certainly in a lot of ways. But the, the manner in which they communicate with players is very personal, very person to person. Dayton Moore is a tremendous person, and they have a lot of great people there. J.J. Piccolo, Gene Watson, Scott Sharp, Jin Wong. It's a great group. and They really understand how to communicate and, and build a club, and that's how they got to back-to-back -back World Series. So that's there's different ways to do it, but I really think, Ryan, that the core of it is honesty. And if you do that well, and if you communicate with players well, I think that is a chance to build the right culture because if you get buy-in from the right guys and you know this, you were, yeah. you were with the Mariners in sort of a transitional time. Yeah. If the veteran players say, listen, I may not love how much playing time I'm getting, but the manager's honest with me. I'm getting information from, from the front office that, that's honest and true. I get it. If, if, the, if the veteran guys are on board, you mm -hmm. got a shot. If the veteran guys are not on board, yeah, 100%. you've got a real problem on your hands. I always talk about a couple of things on that. First of all, I spoke to Justin Dunn the other day, and he talked about the offseason. Scott Service, and this was unheard of 10 years ago. I'm pretty sure in my experience. He flew down to Florida to have a workout, have dinner with him. Then he went over to see Jake Fraley. I mean, this is the kid who's got a month in the big leagues, and I get it. Right. He, but that kind of relationship he's building – is huge. I would go off in the off season, maybe get a text message or a phone call from a manager saying, uh, you know, how's the off season? Yeah, good. Have you been home yet? <laughs> How's Christmas? <laughs> Boom, done. Which is amazing right. because you now I talk to athletes back in Australia or even you know, my, my old man was involved in um, professional rugby. He's like, hold on. So they just basically send you off for an entire four or five months and you don't hear from them until you get back to spring training. Then you rock up. Some guys are out of shape or, or – you know, or, or they, whatever, then they, then they deal with it. Then he, he said, that's amazing. You know, I think to, and you make another good point, the social media aspect and talking to some of these young players, there's such, first of all, they're branding online, like their, their Instagram and their Twitter and everything else, but they can go on and read everything they need to know about themselves. What that, you know, what, whether it's a critique from a blogger, like you talked about, or even from the organization, Jerry DePoto flat out just tells you exactly what the team's doing. That didn't happen 10 years ago. You know, you, you say you do make a, a, a great point when it comes to that. But, you know, and one other thing, you know, w w just with that, you know, talking about the, the, the transparency, the, the one thing in my experience, there was a lot of I'm trying to be trying to communicate. But the message wasn't – you just didn't believe the message. You know what I mean? And then what happened was at 4 o'clock every afternoon during batting practice, that's when those little clusters – you know, all the pitchers stand together out, out here in left field for, you know, 45 minutes during BP. And that's when that one comment or that conversation happens. And then the leadership of the team, one, one veteran guy says, oh, yeah, this team, this is what they're trying to do or blah, blah, blah. And then the whole rumor mill spreads. And it's just a, – it's, it's a completely different dynamic. And – Again, just with that, 2008, you mentioned the Tampa Bay Rays. Uh, Grant Balfour talks about that all the time. Baseball, to me, is not – it's a team sport, but it's such an individual sport. It's 162 games. You're around each other. It's not that communication like in basketball where you have to know where each other is where, where each other is on the floor or football, whatever it may be. It's a pitcher, hitter. But he did say that Joe Madden had that with his players, A, that relationship with them, and two, just that honesty. He just, I mean, Balfour would come in and say, dude, you didn't pitch last night because X, Y, and Z. And he goes, it was amazing. We had a young team and they all just bought in. Well, that's a great point. And, and Joe is one of the managers who has done a very good job of uh, learning Spanish over the years and, and really trying to relate, yeah. uh, in not just linguistically, but culturally. And I think it just, it takes, it takes time to do these jobs the right way. Yeah. I have the utmost respect for the managers in the game because you've got to now understand, okay, you're probably having a front office make at the very least, very strong suggestions about lineups and decisions and, and that sort of thing, how we're going to use the bullpen late. You're getting a lot of information there. You're having to communicate with your coaching staff, and then you have to keep all your players on the same page. And and as you know, being in the clubhouse, these are very diverse environments. Not everybody, yeah. and in fact, you probably have 25 very unique backgrounds uh, mm -hmm. in, in your clubhouse that, that have to be uh, – dealt with in a very sensitive and, and unique way. And, and the little things, we talked about it earlier about international baseball, the little things, 
the ability to, to say hello and, and make even small conversation in a player's native language goes a long way. And I think that's, you think about Jace Tingler and, and his role with the Padres now, Jace is a fluent Spanish speaker. He has done a lot of work in the Dominican Winter wow. League. He's managed there. Um, he has dedicated himself to learning the language. And it's not just conjugating a verb like you would do in the books behind me, which I try to do, <laughs> but it's also the vernacular and the culture and understanding, cuisine, family rituals, all, all right. of those things are, are so important. And, and, they, and at the end of the day, and you know this, Ryan, it's, it's hard. It's hard to play baseball in the major leagues. It's yeah. hard to play baseball anywhere, but especially in the major leagues. And and good luck if you're trying to play baseball at this level when you don't feel supported, comfortable, feel like you belong, feel like yeah. you can be your true self uh, in every way in the clubhouse and, and around everybody. You, you've got to build an environment where being authentic is cool and it's welcomed and it's empowered. And I, and I think that to me is is – you can tell Ryan, and you've been in a lot of clubhouses in your in your career. You can tell it's hard to describe, and who knows what it's going to look like now in, in in this sort of new world. But you can usually develop pretty quickly. You walk into a clubhouse. Is there good talking? Is there a good yeah. pace yeah, to the conversations? Absolutely. Are guys interacting, yeah. or or are you seeing twenty five guys facing inward to the stall on their phone scrolling, and that's all they're doing at exactly. four o'clock? If that's the case, probably not loving it. But if yeah. you're seeing a lot of uh, conversation from b- between people of, d- of different backgrounds and and yeah. and is that, that to me that's what you want to see that's that's what and I, I I'll mention the Royals again in all my years of doing the sideline reporting job being next to the dugout which is one of the coolest honors in baseball to be down mm-hmm. there they're my favorite team to do games with because right. those Royals of 14 15 there was always tons of conversation bouncing all over the place yeah. a lot of joy a lot of smiling they were there were no clicks they were all talking together and that's the magic of the game. That's what it's all about. And guess what? Yeah. That team, the that core, if you ask them, where does that come from? They would say it comes from from Sal Perez and, and Eric Hosmer playing together when they were 17, 18 years old in right. the Pioneer League. And yeah. and having those those dinners together when they were just teenagers. That's that is where it starts. It is so hard, Ryan. It can be done, but it is so hard. You go back in the last 20 years, it, there's maybe a handful of examples where this is true, but you find me a a a team that won the World Series without having a significant percentage of, of homegrown guys who lived and breathed that organization for a long time. There are a handful of outliers, but almost all of them, especially this, the middle to smaller market teams that have won, yeah. almost all of them have the, have the underpinning of guys who have played together and know each other. And, and I'm a believer that when you watch those Cardinals play in 2011, you watch the Royals yeah. play in 14 and 15, even the Cubs to an extent in 16, the Red Sox in 18 with Betts and, and, and that group, you almost go down the line. There are, are almost yeah. the Phillies with Rollins and Utley and Howard. They all play together. I mean, so this, is, this is what you do. You build yeah. a team with, a, with a, especially position players, Ryan, and you know this. Those are the guys that set the tempo because they're there every day. Every day. And yeah. I think that that's, that's where you see magic happen. Yeah, and, and especially even now, um, you know, with the uh, – yeah, in this era. <laughs> Sorry, it looks, looks like I have to give out some gummy bears in a second. No girls, <laughs> girls, I'll give you your gummy bears in, in a couple minutes, okay? Daddy's, daddy's finishing up. You don't need them right now. Daddy's they're, no, they're arguing over the artwork. Yeah, exactly. Exa- right so who, who, who gave the best artwork back here? <laughs> You did. That's right. Yes. Okay. They're 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 all here. Okay. Now, just just one more thing. I want to talk about you and your career, right? Now, mm-hmm. you're a beat writer coming out of Harvard, right? So, you're covering baseball, covering different sports as well. So, when I was in college, actually, I covered hockey. I covered the hockey team largely gotcha. for the Crimson, so the student paper, and then, and then in the spring, I would play on the JV baseball team. So, right. uh, I was I was not second base. Uh, a very a very short slap hitting second baseman which is exactly what Pat Gillick said the first time I met Pat. He looked at me and he said, John, did you ever play? And I said, yeah, I guess. And he said, yeah, you were, you were a slap hitting second baseman. I said, you're right. How'd you know? Exactly. That? He, he, <laughs> he broke me down like, okay, you weren't tall enough to play short. You didn't have the arm strength. You weren't, weren't powerful enough to play the outfield. You weren't strong enough to catch, tall enough to pitch. Yeah, so you were a second baseman. So like, he, he, knew, he knew within like two seconds of looking at me what position yeah. I played. So, that's, so yeah, so I was a, I was a very mediocre uh, second baseman. Uh, if, if they had ever, if they had, if they had had actual shifting, uh, uh, scouting reports, they would have stationed all the outfielders just about 30 feet onto the grass and they would have caught everything I ever hit because it was all just like <laughs> dunking singles into the outfield. That's all I could, that's all I could possibly muster. So, 
Well, you didn't, have, you didn't have time to hit the gym and, and get you. No, there. no, was too, too, too busy, too busy riding there in the course of the year. I'm, I'm going to go with that story. Well said, Ryan. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. Now, one thing, and I just want to talk to you about, about your career. And when, when you say, when I tell people, oh yeah, John Morosi, they all know who you are. Everyone knows who you are. And one thing you do really well is you, de- you talk about these relationships in the clubhouse. You know everyone to a point where it's not just, oh, hey, I've met John Morosi or wanted to talk to me. They talk to you like they're your best buddies, right? Where does that come from? Because I know for me, and, and we're talking, you know, 10 years ago, right? And it might be a little bit different now, but we're talking even back when, when you were getting established and everything else. I would have a beat writer come up to me at the end of the season. So, Hey, can I, can I, can I grab your number like this? And it was kind of super awkward. No, I didn't care. I mean, I was always, you know, very transparent with the media, but I have these veterans come up and go, do not give your number to those guys. Like, you know, the, the media is the enemy, this and that. So where does that come from developing that relationship, you know, being a part of the media and covering these players? It's a great question, Ryan. I mean, it's, it's uh, first of all, I appreciate you saying it. Uh, I, I think I've, I've looked at the game in in the same way that I've had it since I was a kid growing up in a small town in Michigan, which is that, that the game is is a venue to establish connection. It's 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 a special place for all of us to gather, uh, yeah. certainly uh, as Americans and as people around the world. And so I've I've tried to come at it from that angle. And and certainly yes, there are times, especially when you're a beat writer, where you may have to write a tough story or a critical story. That's and that's part of the job. Uh, and there's, but I also, I've also been a, uh, a believer that there's a way to do that. There's a way to write uh, with facts, with with the perspective that comes from having done your homework and really spent yeah. the time with with the person. I think if if you come at it with the idea that I want to learn about who you are, and sometimes players aren't comfortable sharing, and that's okay. That's that mm-hmm. you have to be okay with that. Uh, and, and I think it's it's a, a lot about honesty, not taking cheap shots. Um, th- there's, there's nothing wrong with if a player's one for 50, you could say he's one for 50. You don't have to say, yeah, this is the worst hitter I've ever seen right. in my entire career. There's, there's two different ways to do yeah. this. And, yeah. and I, th- and a lot of it, my, my mentor uh, in newspaper writing, John Lowe, great man. And, and, and John believed a lot of those things and passed on to me, Ken Rosenthal, same thing. And Kenny, I, I, I owe my career to him. And so I've learned wow. so much from Kenny, both writing and also on, on the air about just being fair and being thorough and doing your homework. I, yeah. I, I just think that's, that's a big thing is, is being, is, is being empathetic to the player, understanding how hard the game is, uh, understanding and appreciating the game. And, and I hope that how much I love the game comes out in, in what I do, whether it's on the air or writing. And I, and I think if the players can really sense that, I think you, you can speak to that too, Ryan, in your own career, you're, you usually can discern pretty quickly the, the motivation of the, of the broadcaster, writer, whoever it is, the, does this person really love the game or is it yeah. more of a, is there, is there an angle here on the story that doesn't really right. sound like it's, it's, it's what I want to be talking about. So I, I yeah. think for me, I, I've just, I've been lucky, frankly, to work at places that value storytelling, both Fox and MLB network have been phenomenal. MLB.com yeah. about, about we're not, we're not looking for a gotcha story here. We're just, we're looking yeah. for stories that make the game come alive. And so I've been right. lucky to, to be able to share those stories. And, and I think most of all, Ryan, just be, interested in the players stories i I, yeah. I am fascinated by how you get to be a great player uh where you've come from what your high school was like what your family's like growing up because those are, are things that all shape you and i, I uh, i've been lucky you know, I'm, I'm also a big hockey fan too and so yeah. uh watching uh watching a lot of hockey here in, in michigan sometimes it's on the canadian uh, network of course cbc and hockey Night in canada and I've, I've told the great scott oak um, who was their eminent Southern reporter there in Farrakhan in Canada. One of the best questions that he always asks at, at the end of the Stanley Cup, the cup's being passed around the ice. There's this incredibly emotional moment. He'll always ask the players about where they were from, who they want to share it with, and who right. the most influential coaches are. Yeah. And and I and it's a question I love. I've told Scott, it's like I've, I've certainly have, I've borrowed it at different times in, in, in my, <laughs> my career because yeah. it's just it speaks to – it speaks to what it takes to get there, and and I think we we cannot lose sight of that. Yes, I realize it was great that you hit the one the one two slider in the third inning. That's what's wonderful. But I I, yeah. I want to be able to tell. Well, how did you get here? There's got to be a kid somewhere watching this yeah. back home that wants to know how can I be that guy. And I right. think that if you're if you're able to help the, the the viewer back home, the young boys and girls watching to to dream those big dreams, I, I think that's what yeah. we're all here for. There's there's plenty. I'm a believer, Ryan. And and certainly there's there's a place for all this. There are plenty yeah. of places on on the, the TV dial to go to 
for real world and, and sobering, somber things. There's plenty of spots for that. I, I think for, especially now more than ever, it's our job to, to be a place to come together and learn from each other and share yeah. our backgrounds and share our stories. And I think if we have that as, as, a, as a guiding light of what we're all about, that I think that the game will truly be uh, th that important meeting place that it's always been for our country and for the world. Yeah, and and uh, you know, again, I just want to one more thing. I'll let you go. I know I know you got to get out of here. But uh, first of all, I mean, you know, you helped me a ton. Um, yeah, you know, I, I met you only in November, and then and we hit it off. And one thing that I was talking to some of the the other younger broadcasters, you know, with Tyler and Alex Cohen, you know, Tyler Martin, Alex Cohen, a couple of these guys we were working with. And they're sitting there, oh man, Morosi, he's just he's the dude. And I said, yeah, he 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 separates himself, right? And and so there, there's ways that you separate yourself. I'm going to ask you a, a couple things. Put your mentoring hat on in a second. But I remember, you know, for, for the winter meetings in in December, I called you, and I was really nervous about going to my first ever winter meetings, trying to get in, and 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 you know, because I'm new to this, you know, I've done it for a couple of years, but I want to I want to do things on a higher level, so. And, and I appreciate that everything everything you gave me for uh, the winter meetings was a blast uh, to help me out a lot. If you were to put, if you had a kid coming out of out of college right now, and he said, "I want to cover baseball or any sport on the John Morosi level, the Ken Rosenthal level," yeah, you guys are the are the go tos. You know, Jeff Passan even. Mm -hmm. If I want to cover this game on that level, what what are three things you would say to separate himself to separate themselves? Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's a great question. I was I would certainly first of all aspire to cover like Kenny and Jeff do, and not and, and not not me. Uh, they're 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 on they're on a high, much higher level than I am. I would say, um, but I, I I think this number one, find some find some unique traits that you bring that fit with your voice and the way that you want to celebrate right. the game, and and that could be you are either a great newsbreaker. Uh, and then that comes from just a lot of relationships, a lot of phone calls with agents yeah. and executives and, and really and really having that news mindset and hunger to just make those all those text messages and phone calls and emails to develop those sources. That's one thing. I, I think just having having that that known job description, if you want to call it interest area that you love analytics, you love breaking yeah. news. You love making it making it advantage of the new data that, that's in the game, or as you know, international topics as as I've really enjoyed. But find find those skills. Maybe you're you're really familiar with economics or, or statistics. Mm -hmm. Find something in your background that lends itself prospects. Another thing uh, to, right. to be involved in uh, yeah. th that allows you to really capitalize on on that voice and platform. It, maybe it's learning another language or having spoken one since you were a kid. That's also really incredibly important. So the ability, I think, to have like know what your place is in terms of the space of, of covering baseball. Know, know where you can make your greatest contribution. And then I think that the other couple of things would be never stop reaching out to people. It's still, uh, you know, even at this point in my career, there's always, there's always people that you can meet for the first time yeah. and learn something from. And, and I, there are so many times, and you've seen this, when you're, when you're in the clubhouse, and what do you see? You see writers talking to writers. I love the other writers. They're great people. But that's that's a special time. And again, who knows what the rules yeah. will be like now going forward. But that's yeah. a special time. You should talk to the players. You Absolutely. have a chance to talk yeah. to the players, talk to the coaches, talk to the athletic trainers, talk to everybody. But I can talk to the writers upstairs in the press box hanging out at 7 o'clock. But I, I can't talk to the guys yeah. that are on the field at 7 o'clock. So take advantage of the time and the access that you've got. And then I think... Probably the third, the third, and one of the bigger things is just try to always keep find something to keep things fresh and learning about the people that you're covering. Have that curiosity about how a player develops and from where they they are emerging and and what what goes into their their story. I, I think that to your point, Ryan, players appreciate a, a well researched, well thought out question about how they got there. And and right. I think that when you when you've done your homework and you've prepared. Don't be afraid to ask those questions that maybe haven't been asked before. If there's a part of someone's bio that hasn't quite come up, say, hey, I was reading a story and and I didn't really hear about a lot about your high school experience. What was that like? You know, when you've done your homework, feel secure that you've done your homework and that you are as entitled to ask that question as anybody else. And and ask it with not necessarily you're not you're not going to walk in and, and let, like you're owning the place. But but say, yeah. hey, you know, I, I read this story. And can you share a little more about about that? I'd be curious to know about it. And I think just having that that curiosity that comes from studying, I think is is a really key part of the process. Study, read, enjoy, sort of marinate on it, 
And then when you when it comes time to ask the questions, you do so with confidence. You have your fastball there because you know yeah. you know where the where, where the real essence of the story actually lies. Right. Okay. Hey, I appreciate it. I'll, I'll, I'll let you go. I'm honored to have you on the podcast and that backdrop. I keep looking around. <laughs> I'm looking for that Rosetta Stone. I see some yellow. Yeah. Back there. Yeah. The we got. Uh, yeah, yeah. Ned Coletti's book, Passon's yeah. book, Brian Kenny's book. They're all, they're all there. Terry Francona's book. With with Dan Shaughnessy, yeah. So a, a lot of a lot of the greats are on the shelf, and awesome. and uh, I haven't I haven't gotten around to writing a book yet. Who knows if, if I ever will? But uh, uh, m- maybe someday when when I don't have quite as many fruit snacks to distribute as I do right now with with, with the kids buzzing around. Just just do an audio book. You, you're good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that sounds great, Ryan. It was, it's awesome. a pleasure, and we'll find a way. Certainly, uh, working with you at the Olympic qualifier was a great th- thrill yeah. there at the WBSC Premier Twelve, and let's hope that we can uh, be together again real soon. Sounds good. Thanks, John. Appreciate it, buddy. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Thank you.